Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of the country's biggest stars and some of my favourite people. And we've got one for you today. Lucy Porter is one of the most charming and hysterical comedians on the road at the moment. She's back in 2018. I think she's on the road from February through until June. Are you insane? You're choosing your battles, aren't you? I am choosing my battles, my darling. Thank you. That introduction made me blush. How lovely. Um... I, yes, I'm, I'm doing a spring tour this year because uh, I used to tour in the autumn and then I realised there's nothing more depressing than seeing the nights get darker as your tour goes on, <laughs> as you're sort of stuck on Hull Station in the freezing cold. So, uh, so yes, I'm, I'm emerging from the cocoon of winter, uh, starting my tour in February and then by the time I finish it will be uh, glorious, flaming sunshine. Very the wonderful nice. summers that we get in this country, obviously. Uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be a joy. Yes, well, instead of darkness, you'll just have rain, won't you? So, yeah, exactly, nice. yeah, but hot, hot rain. <laughs> Always the optimist, that's what I like about you. you. Oh, yeah. You do come on stage with an energy, and I'm a bit funny with stand-up comedians. I, I've tried to go to comedy clubs, and it seems I don't have a sense of humour, because a lot of them, I just don't get it. You're one that sort of draws from your own warmth. You're not trying to be cynical. There's a lot of that about, isn't there? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I've always felt that I go to comedy clubs to be cheered up and so that is kind of what I try and do uh, and uh, you know it's difficult at the moment because there is so much doom and gloom and the, the world is not to my mind in a particularly happy place but um, I yeah I kind of always feel like well if I can't look on the bright side then uh, then things are in a, in a dire state because I am generally a ridiculously positive person so, uh, so yeah, and, I mean, I know some people find it irritating, but I'm delighted that you're, you're one of the people who can tolerate my, my cheery demeanour. Um, but, yeah, I get it from my mum. My mum was, like, the most positive woman. Uh, you know, she was one of those people, like, oh, you've lost your legs, never mind, you'll save money on shoes. You know? <laughs> so that's, my, that's always been my outlook on life, is that you can always... I, and, I mean, the beautiful thing about being a comedian is no matter how awful things are and how miserable things are for you personally or for the world in general, you can always use it as material because yeah. there's there's very few situations that you can't find something yeah. funny or or positive to say about I think well, I've always felt no matter how bad my career is or no matter how ugly my face is, at least I'm not Rylan or Gemma Collins. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> There's always someone worse off, isn't there? <laughs> too true. Too true, my darling. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'd like to think that people can uh, can look at me sometimes and go, well, at least I'm not her. That's what some, some of my show is about me. Sort of, and people always say, oh, you know, uh, c- comedians are so self-deprecating. But... Mm. Um, I think there is an element of yeah, get it in, you know, get your own bullying in first, bully yourself before anyone yeah. else can. And uh, well, it yeah, saves time, are, doesn't it? It does. Well, and I think the, the other nice thing to do is, is sort of as an antidote to social media, where everybody's trying to put their best face forward and say how wonderful their lives are. I think mm. it's doing a great service if you're just honest. And so in my show, I'm painfully honest about some of the. Um, you know the, the the problems in my life and my marriage <laughs> and my general uh, general world mm. and uh, you know I think people quite like that. You make people a good like point. That. I think 2017 was interesting. There's never been a year more full of bullshit. You go on Facebook and people who are getting divorced are still pretending they're happy, and people are going on holiday when it's raining and putting up yesterday's photos of the sunshine. I choose yeah, not yeah. to do any of it because I'd rather I'd rather not be the guy that's miserable one day and happy the next and say nothing. It is an interesting world we live in that we're all now PRs it's extraordinary yes I know and I'm my own worst PR and always have been and uh, <laughs> I you know I, I admire people who can because as I say I mean I always try and put a brave face on but you know I, I'm not very good at uh, pretending things are okay when they're not and I think yeah that is you know but social media I think is really interesting in that I think we've reached the kind of the peak of awfulness where people are vile to each other and yes. showing off and it's it, it's so awful that I kind of think it can only get better um, and I do, I do talk about it in the show actually I do, I've got a sort of bit about social media and about how you choose your battles on social media when you stand up to people and when you back down and I mean spoiler alert but generally uh, my advice is just don't don't fight with people on social media because it's never a good look mm. and uh, you know I just don't think shouting at people on Twitter really achieves anything ever I think you're much better off going to the pub and sorting out over a pint 
I said to a guy once who was constantly putting his opinions on Twitter and then wondering why he was in these wars and having to phone the police because people were saying nasty things. It's amazing if you don't have an opinion on Twitter how people don't attack you back. That's yeah, also yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, but you can not have an opinion and still be attacked. That's yes, well. That's the wonderful thing, is that, you, you know, you, I like dogs. Uh, cue 50 angry tweets from people who... Who like cats. You know, <laughs> I mean, it is, it's impossible not to be controversial nowadays, yeah. which is, uh, you know, which is fine. And I, having been a comedian since, you know, the late 1800s, I, I have in many ways over many times been involved in controversies and people being offended by things I've said. And, you know, you sort of learn that it's not really worth anyone getting too upset about this when there are real problems out there in the world, you know. Yeah. So I think a sense of perspective is what it's always important to keep, isn't it? I also love the Joan Rivers theory of never apologise for a joke, because if you do that, it undermines your entire act. Is that your theory? No, I have apologised, actually. Um, I know, I mean, I, I love Joan Rivers, but I'm not her. And um, so, no, I, I, I think if someone has... I, over the years, I've had to apologise to, uh, you know, the people of Derby. Um, well, who hasn't? Neo Sayer. Because, <laughs> 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 you know, sometimes you will make a joke. Well, for example, I used to have a little routine about um, Prince Harry, like, when I was younger, and I just thought, you know, because he was just a bit of an idiot at the time. And now I think he's proved himself to be a, a, a man of great character and worth and someone said oh you did that really awful stuff about Prince Harry and I was like yeah I do I do apologise for that it was mean I was, I've been mean in my life about people when maybe I maybe I shouldn't you know and uh, I don't it's been in the wrong I never mind saying I've been in the wrong but you can't rewrite history I mean if people change as we all do and we all evolve and we all try and learn and change you can't sort of reflect and act from 15 years ago in 2018 because obviously you've changed no. and they've changed haven't they well and that's why I do I'm always slightly wary of stand-up being recorded or, um, yeah, I think the beauty of stand-up is it's quite ephemeral. And because you are trying to sort of talk in the moment and you're trying to be as honest and as open as you can, mm. it's very easy to say things that in 10 years' time might look, people go, oh my gosh, why did you say that? You know, and, and yeah, I think there's, and it, I mean, well, it happens on Twitter as well, doesn't it, where people make jokes you know, 10 years ago that oh, yeah. now people yeah. kind of go, oh, hang on a minute, that that wasn't a very nice thing to say. And you're, you're like, yeah, but it's a really difficult one because some things are just vile and, you know, some some things are just unpleasant and some things are okay at the time but then look a bit mm. odd, you know. It, anyway, it's, very, it's, a, it's a very complex and nuanced issue. Yeah. I wonder what your life's been like. Have you ever not had an audience? Because it seems to me you've been doing this most, if not all, of your life. <laughs> I was born, born in the trunk. Um, yeah, I mean, I did start very young. I started doing stand up when I was uh, in my early twenties, straight fresh out of college, really. And um, yeah, so it's it, it has been a, a worryingly long time. And I, I, yeah, I don't know what I would do now because stand ups never really retire. That's the thing. You know, there's very few people who give it up because it is so intoxicating, isn't it? That mm. you know, it's lovely being able to have an idea and then go out in front of an audience. And you know, not like telly or radio where you have to wait for someone to commission it and then, you know, you record it and it gets edited and then you put it out. You know, with stand-up, it's very live and very immediate. And it's, um, yeah, I love it. I love that fact that there's always an audience there to tell your latest thoughts to. Mm. It's like therapy, but the, they pay you. The only inconvenience, though, is getting to them, schlepping all over the country. That must be yeah. tiresome because the roads aren't exactly brilliant and the trains aren't necessarily on time, are they? No, well, I've kind of... I, I, yeah, I mean... There's no good way of doing it. I've done everything in my uh, touring life, uh, from you know trains, coaches. I've done I've done a mega bus once oh, or twice no. in my life, <laughs> and that is if you ever want to know what it's like to be cattle, uh, I recommend. Wow. That as an there can't be anything more humiliating than arriving in Leeds at half past five, having had a thirteen-hour journey from London for a pound. Oh, I know with someone else's saliva on his shoulder. <laughs> Coventry. Are you allowed to buy two tickets for two pounds if you're on the mega bus, so nobody sits next to you? Or is that not allowed? I mean, to be honest, I'd splash out and uh, buy the ten. No, that's a completely different thing. I'm talking about a ticket. No. Uh, uh, splashing out one way to get your own ticket. No, um, uh, yes, I, I tend to drive now though because we uh, 
we now live in the London suburbs. Oh, look at uh, you. And, but I know, I know, I know, I've arrived. Uh, and uh, But, uh, yeah, so we're near the M40, so I tend to just zip up in my, uh, in my Ford Fusion. Very nice. The dream. What is it like <laughs> nearly making it to London, on the periphery of London, but, of course, having no money because you live on the periphery of London? That must be a, an interesting change. Yeah, it is. You sort of look at the... Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we used to live in Zone 1, but back in the wow. day, you know... It's so nuts that, uh, yeah, London has become this sort of... You'll be living in Swindon before you know it. <laughs> well, there are worse things. There are a few worse things than living in Swindon. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I quite like being... Uh, to be honest, suburban life suits me very well because I'm, I'm born and raised in Croydon, one of the most beautiful of the London suburbs. Mm-hmm. And uh, so uh, we live in a different suburb now. But I, suburban life is very nice. There's nothing I enjoy more than hanging around a shopping centre. I love a multi-storey car park. Do you? Uh, I love an out of town Nando's, you know, all of these things they excite me way more than urban living in a kid. Well, I, and my husband's a real country boy mm. and I you know, and I've always lived in urban, so the suburbs is a kind of nice compromise for us. There's a bit of greed but I can still get to an Nando's if I really need. To. Well, we've just got a new drive through Costa in Nottingham. You've no idea no how happy this makes me. I mean No way. I mean, I'm telling yeah, you don't even need to get out of the car. No, no, no. <laughs> you can get fat just sitting there, not even burn off a calorie. Marvellous. Lovely, lovely, that's what I want. When you're choosing your battles over the next five months, how do you know these battles are funny? Because I'm always curious how you work out that this is a good gag and that's not. I mean you do Edinburgh every year. Where do you try stuff out? Yeah, evolving process so yeah I mean the thing is the only way to know something is funny is to put it in front of an audience because as every comic knows there's that painful moment where you write something in your room and you dance around and giggle and think this is brilliant this is the most amazing comedic routine that has ever been known this will you know live on forever as the great piece of comedy that everyone was waiting for and then you go out that night in front of an audience and you try out that material and it dies mm. so hard and nobody laughs and um, there's uh, and you know and then another night you say something completely spontaneously that you're not even intending to be funny and it brings the house down so it's trial and error is the only way to do it and um, and I find uh, I try and write a new hour of comedy every year for the Edinburgh Festival in August and then I tour that adding some new bits taking away bits that yeah, I don't like anymore for whatever reason and um, it sort of evolves so then by the next Edinburgh I've got a new a new hour of stuff and, and so life goes on until we all die very nice I love to hear you on the radio I sit there and having me tea about half past six and whether it's the news quiz or any of those programmes on Radio 4 you're normally magnificent on them and they're not easy to find that blend and not be a pain in the arse you seem to do that very well how long did that take to have the confidence to sit there and feel part of it? Oh well you're very kind because I do I still feel like I'm sort of finding my feet with everything really you know I don't think you ever feel like oh yes I know how to do that now but um, but yes I I mean, I think age and not caring so much is a great uh, bonus, with, particularly with Radio 4, because it is all about just being relaxed and not trying too hard. Mm. And um, frankly, at this stage in my life, I'm too tired to try too hard. So <laughs> too busy. I think that's, yeah, that's what people quite like it, if you just sort of, if you're just yourself and you're a bit tired. We've well, got a megabus to catch. You haven't got time to get excited well, over Radio 4. Recovering from one megabus. <laughs> 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 they are unique though aren't they those environments when you sit there and you look to the left of you and to the right and you see these legends and of course it obviously is a compliment because you've been invited and you're there but you don't want to trample all over it oh I know well, the first time I did um, have I got news for you I, mean, I just I didn't even say anything or show you because I was just looking on the set going oh my gosh I'm, <laughs> I'm on that set that I've seen for years you know that's so iconic and so yeah you have to kind of you have to believe that you've earned the right to be there but it is very difficult sometimes when you're sitting with absolute comedy legends I mean I now go for a pint with Barry Cryer which you know it's just it's an absolute dream come true Mm. that you know and when I was so I was a kid and I was listening in my bedroom to Radio 4 comedy and I used to be like a bit of a comedy nerd and I would listen to everything and Clive Anderson hosted the first ever stand-up show I listened to which was called The Cabaret Upstairs on Radio 4 and you know like now I work with him all the time I'm working with him again tomorrow and it's still wow. you still get those weird little fangirl moments where you go yeah. I can't believe it he's just there he's next to me he's talking to me so can yeah. you remember your first joke I remember being in the car with my dad and the HUD lines was on 
And oh, yeah. the joke was a BA captain had been arrested for getting drunk. And the punchline was something along the lines of when it came over the tannoy, whiskey, whiskey, tango, that wasn't the name of the plane. That was the captain's drinks order. <laughs> I mean, they're beautiful guys. You don't hear many like that anymore. But that was the first time I thought, oh, that's funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, with me, it was um, Dave Allen. Was the, my mum and dad used to watch Dave Allen. Nice. And I kind of could remember the routines. And I used to sit there and do the routines with a glass of whiskey and a fag. <laughs> Which now, I think, you know, social services would have got involved. But doesn't work for every seven-year-old, does it? So I, was, <laughs> I was, yeah, seven or eight and, no, I mean, I didn't actually smoke, but I was holding a lit fag and a glass of whiskey. And there's pictures of me wow. doing my Dave Allen impersonation. But yeah, no, I, you know, there, there are certain golden eras of comedy. And um, and I mean, I think there's a load of great stuff uh, on telly at the moment. You know, there's, there's some really good stand-ups and, uh, you know, there'll be another generation of people being inspired by people around at the moment, hopefully. It is funny how it comes in waves, though. It seems like there's certain years or certain periods where we get a lot, and then it sort of goes quiet for a bit. I mean, around the Alan Carr time, there was a lot of sort of new comedians. Going back, the Ben Elton generation, of course, there was tons of them. Do you think we're due a new sort of um, influx of young comedians? Because it seems very tough. I mean, it's such big business now as well, isn't it? That the, They don't want to play clubs. They want to go straight to arenas. Yeah, and it's like, I think, you know, the thing is, it was television, it was go, it's sort of cyclical, so like in the 70s there was a lot of comedy on television in terms of things like the comedians and wheel tappers and shunters, and there was a lot of opportunity for stand-ups to be on telly, and then that kind of disappeared, and then there was the, like you say, the Ben Elton generation, and it wanes for a bit, so it, I mean, it's always a sort of boom and bust cycle, and I'm not quite sure where we are in that at the moment, but... Uh, we shall see, we shall see. There, there may be, I think, a sort of quiet period where, because TV commissioners suddenly decide, oh, no, we don't want comedy anymore, it's all about drama, or... Mm. I mean, because sitcom is, is inclined, you know, when you think of all the amazing sitcoms they used to be, and now there are very few, like, no, I think not... There's not a single sitcom in the top ten of the BBC's output at the moment. Nope. It's, unless it's a repeat of Dad's Army or Only Fools, you know, there's no... They're not making that many original sitcoms, but I'm sure that will, you know, maybe stand up will start to wane and sitcom will return. Who knows? And I did notice the number one show on Channel 5 over Christmas was Cruising with Jane McDonald. <laughs> so, Good for her. Need we say yeah. any more? Uh, I like to see a middle aged lady on television. You will never hear any complaints from me about that. Have you ever done the cruise ships? I worry that I'd end up tossing myself off or something because they can be quite claustrophobic, <laughs> can't they? Hello. Um, yeah, no, I, I have done one cruise. Have you? Uh, it, it was fine. I got away with it. But, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, in fact, my agent was just saying that they, they'd approached again about doing it, so I might, I might have another bite of the cruise cherry. I hear normally the cruise directors ask for your last joke, your middle joke, and your beginning joke, and you can't say this and you can't say that, and you certainly can't do yeah. jokes about cruising. It makes it tough for comedians, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I know. If you said you were going to toss yourself off, you'd be, you would be off that boat. And <laughs> you see, that's your mucky mind. I didn't even know I'd said that. You didn't say anything. No, no I, I, I didn't know. at all. I hate asking you this next question, and of course, I've, I've got to because it's so relevant, especially with us having a female-only big brother this year and all the stuff that's going on. Have you ever felt, because what's interesting from my perspective, I just look at funny or not funny. I look at talented or not talented. I don't bother looking at male or female or anything else. Have you ever felt like the industry sort of held you back because you're not a man well it's, it's hard to tell because you know it, I'd have to try being a man as well I, frankly, time well it is possible so, I mean uh, have you got a, a stray I, sausage from Christmas anywhere that we can <laughs> but no I think I would find uh, yeah I don't know I mean I think yeah the, you know every every industry has had problems as we have seen uh, recently but I kind of I think comedy is one of the better ones if I'm honest I think that there is um you know, as you say, it, funny is funny. So if you're funny, then you tend to get on, and if you're not, then you tend not to. And obviously, there have been sort of issues and problems above that. But yeah. but yeah, I have hope anyway. I have hope. You can see Lucy Porter on tour from February second in Reading, Fareham, Hemel Hempstead, Colchester. Uh, you can see her in Farnham and Swindon right through until June. Go to the website www.lucyporter.co.uk. I've loved talking to you. You are a classic yeah, comedian who you. is hysterical. We love seeing you. And uh, let's talk again. Thank you for your time. Yes, please let's, Alex. Lovely to speak to you. Have a lovely day.